this museum, although we have been doing uh, a version of this for 28-ish years, <coughs> where we uh, vet work, bring it in, and people help us collect it. Um, we just started doing this event three years ago, and it's uh, geared towards collecting emerging artists and contemporary art um, that is uh, maybe different than the other kinds of art that this museum has traditionally collected. Um, and the question about how do we figure out what art we want to present, um, it, artists normally don't submit to us. I and Adam both do tons and tons of research and we find out what is available and on the market or maybe a gallery has it and we look at it and think that this group would be a really good combination of things to show together and they're different mediums and they're about different things and this is sort of like a curated group by us and then it is, of all of the works, even though we can't collect them all because we don't have that much money, all of the works have been approved by our collections committee, uh, pre-approved for the event. So if we did collect one, it's great because we already, <coughs> that's good. We don't have to go back and go, do you guys think you want it? <laughs> so it's already pre-approved. So. Okay, so does everybody feel like they looked pretty closely at the art that I pointed out? Um, so, now what I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time giving you the same spiel that I get, gave everybody on Saturday night. I'm going to talk a little bit about each artist and about the work itself. So, where should we start? Which piece do you want to start with? We presented this work by Shelley Reed, who is an artist who lives in Boston. She's exhibited extensively, she's in many private collections, and she's in the permanent collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Hallmark Collection, Fidelity Investment Corporation, Wellington Management Company, and the De Cordova Museum and Sculpture Park. She recontextualizes imagery gleaned from art historical sources. Uh, her primary focus has been on Northern European art from the mid-17th through 18th centuries, a period of enlightenment and profound interest in science, nature, and the animal world. Animals were assigned human traits, and nature itself was considered a symbol of God's provenance, a commonly held belief within the stratified, gentry-dominated social order of the time. We had a giant exhibit of her work two years ago in a couple galleries back, and this piece is called After Lancier, and Edwin Lancier is an artist that we have in our permanent collection. Um, and if we have time at the end, I'll show you guys where that piece is. And if we collect this piece uh, for the permanent collection, we will hang it right next to our Lancier. So we will be able to have a contemporary artist having a visual conversation with an older work of art, which is very exciting for us. Does anybody have any questions? The red deer is uh, Europe's uh, elk. <laughs> it's, it's a ceramic. It's ceramic. I know. It, almost. It's glass. Another one of the things that gets really hard. <laughs> okay, if you didn't look close, come look at, the, at this slab and look at the bird. Did everybody do that? <laughs> what did you see? Okay, it's, I'm going to be asking you some questions, so please answer. <laughs> what did you see? Is there something in common with the slab and the bird? This is like black and all black and white. That's true. You know, it looks but bluish. in terms of this and this, did you? Did anybody see any similarities? The same but true. Yep. Okay, I don't think you guys looked close enough. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, Mark Petrovic is a glass artist. He went to the Cleveland Institute of Art. He is the recipient of the Agnes Gund Award and a Louis Comfort Tiffany nominee. He's in many museum collections, the Tucson Museum of Art, the Fuller Craft Museum, Vero Beach Art Museum, the Tacoma Museum of Glass, the Corning <laughs> Museum of Glass, and the Museum of Art and Design, among others. 
For two decades, he's used birds and bird imagery as a metaphor for his ruminations on relationships, parenting, home, shelter, and geographical identification. He is drawn to ideas of identity that grow out of a sense of place and self. He seldom makes the actual species. So this is not a bird that you're going to find out in the world. This is his invention of a bird. Um, he strives for anatomical believability, not accuracy, and he hopes for the essence of the beings, not the reproduction. In this series, which is called Avian, and this work it, in, in particular is called Avian Pair, which is why I wanted you to look closely at it. Do you see two? Yeah? <laughs> um, so he takes a closer look at the subject as he pixelates deconstructs and then reconstructs the birds. He pixelates by making his own marini glass, which is little tiny slices of glass all lined up like this and then f that are fused together. And he assembles and fuses them into abstract pattern tablets. He calls this a tablet, um, which uh, he views as a fully realized deconstructed bird. Um, and then he takes a second tablet, exactly the same, that's cut from that same piece of glass, and uses his, he says, hot origami to form this bird out of the second tablet, which is why it is called avian pear. Um, this bird is perching on the, an identical tablet to the one which he created, um, and he's using it as a reminder of its past, and it represents the shadow, the cartography, the DNA, and it's built much like we are, one piece or experience at a time. ...is part of the Italian Cracking Art Group, which does art manifestations worldwide. It's in private collections, had museum shows, and been at art, a bunch of art fairs. He uses recycled material and pop art and Dadaism and surrealism and humor to talk about environmental issues. What do you guys notice about these penguins? They're carrying plastic. canisters. Can't hear anybody. They're carrying oh. canisters. There's plastic bottles. So these penguins are carrying around their own drinking water because there might not be any good drinking water where they're going. Um, he also makes uh, some dogs that are wearing boots because the uh, sea level is rising. Um, so what he's doing with these penguins is calling for greater ecological awareness, and he's urging us to reflect on the consequences of climate change um, through humor and all of these other things. So we offer these as a set of six penguins. You can buy them individually, but I think they're more interesting as a set. symbols drawn from the daily news, from his own sculpture, and from nature. In this print, a jaguar walks past an array of mythological creatures, uh, and it's unaware of its fate as a threatened species. Did you guys find anything that was interesting to you in the background here? It's kind of like almost, it's almost empty. It's kind of close to empty. No in the In which part? In the background? Yeah. Oh, because it's so simple? Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is really funny in here is there's this strange guy here with a gas mask on. There's a television up here with a bunch of heads in it. There's a wheelbarrow full of bones. So come up close and look at all of these funny things. They're from all different cultures. Like this is a Syrian. Yep. Uh, this looks more Egyptian-ish. So they're not all South Americans, they just look at the cattle Right. So, um, a jaguar was see, uh, seen as a god in Peru, Mexico, Guatemala, and pre-Columbian America. 
It means he who kills with one blow. In Mayan mythology, the jaguar was seen as the ruler of the underworld, uh, a symbol of the night sun and darkness. The jaguar once roamed from Argentina and South America all the way up to the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Uh, today, it's almost completely eliminated from the U.S. and endangered throughout its range, stretching down to Patagonia. So this is, artist's name is Juan Fontenvie, and he has an undergraduate degree from Syracuse University and an MFA from the Royal College of Art in London. He is the 2010 recipient of the Jurwood Painting Prize. His studio is in Bushwick, New York. He's had many solo exhibitions all over the world. Um, and his work reflects a dual interest in the rhythmic pulse of the natural world and the modern era's invention of the moving image. Uh, these are aluminum cubes uh, machined. He, does, he machines them. He made all of the parts of these to flip through 72 double-sided screen prints depicting birds, moths, and butterflies that are sourced from 18th and 19th century nat natural history illustrations. This one is from those illustrations. And then the moth, is um, an original hand-drawn image from, of his own from one of his paintings. Um, the perpetual movement through the images creates an illusion of flight, uh, and it, it flips through the images at half the rate of film. And he does this so that we, our eye is able to actually register and look at all of these individual 72 images. Um, uh, it, it has the flip book movement, it references early film and the moving images, it incorporates printmaking um, and natural history illustrations, and if you have gotten up close to them, it also has a really beautiful sound as they're moving. Um, all right, let's go look at some graphite drawings over there. This is a really young artist from Portland, Oregon. Her name is Zoe Keller. Uh, she just graduated from Maryland Institute College of Art uh, in 2011. These are graphite drawings, uh, very large and detailed, as you can see, uh, looking at a bunch of environmental topics. She is an artist as a social commentator, uh, as an agent of po for policy, policy change, and her compositions re sort of reference uh, other uh, previous artists like Audubon um, and uh, other illustrators. So this piece, it has three species in it. It's called Fire. It has the Mississippi Sandhill Crane, the Black Pine Snake, and branches of a Gowan, Gowan Cypress that has flames. It's, it's got fire coming up from it. All three of these species have an important relationship to fire. The Mississippi Sandhill Crane lives in a particular type of rare wetland environment that must be maintained by periodic wildfire. The, uh, the black pine snake lives in the longleaf pine forest whose plant diversity depends on frequent burns. And the Gowan Cypress, only found in two small stands in California, um, its cones only release seeds when they're heated by wildfire. Where's Shannon? And the cool word is? Does anybody know what a cone is? No, a cone is that needs fire to open. Yes. It's about to see engagement because the fire is opening the cone. Yeah. It's engagement. You need engagement for the fire for the cone to open. It's called the rot in this cone. Yeah. And there are two. Is Lisa here? There are two uh, trees in this area that need that also. Yes. Um, this piece over here is called Prey, and it depicts Channel Island foxes, Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep, and the coastal California gnat catcher. And a fourth species that I don't know what it is, there, there is a tiny little snail right there, and I'm going to need to call the artist to figure out why she put a snail in there. Um, so all of the, these three 
these species have either been prey or prey to some kind of environmental uh, thing that's affecting them. Um, let's see. Uh, Two of these animals have had major success stories. The Channel Island foxes were one of 37 species that actually have been taken off of the environment of the endangered species list um, uh, due to recovery. So they got down to about 24 of them and they, on the Channel Islands are off the coast of California, off Santa Barbara. Um, and they're due to a whole bunch of different factors um, the golden eagles were eating them all, and uh, there are a bunch of feral pigs running around. The golden eagles liked eating them, and um, the golden eagles came in after the bald eagles uh, were having problems because of DDT and eggs hatching. So now there are, they got rid of the pigs, and they got the golden eagles to go away, and so now the foxes are doing pretty well. Um, the Sierra Nevada bighorn uh, went into like an emergency list, uh, listing on the environment, on the Endangered Species Act, and um, so now we, I think, have gotten back up to maybe 600 uh, Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep. They've been reintroduced into Yosemite, which they had uh, not been in for a while, and they're about 30 use away from being like moved up on the list. <laughs> so they're, uh, they're doing pretty well. And then the uh, Cal Coastal California gnat catcher uh, is a bird that um, has been, 90% of its coastal sage scrub habitat has been destroyed due to human development. So um, this is called prey. So she's trying to group together some animals that probably that don't live in the same place to talk about things that are, that they have in common: fire and uh, golden eagles and all kinds of other other things. Um, let's see. So let's do some voting, and then you guys can help us. You can see how we did in collecting. <laughs> and if we get through the voting, then we can go into the galleries and look at the Lancier painting that we would like to hang that Shelley Reed next to. So, um, so this is the exact ballot that we use at the Blacktail Gala. So each guest receives this ballot, but replicated six times over to go through different rounds. So depending on how quickly the money is spent, um, the voting stops. Um, so what you are going to do, like all of the guests at the party, is circle what piece you would like the museum to first acquire. Um, and then we will see if you made the same choice as the rest of the guests. So there are pencils floating around. If you want to circle your top choice, we will then have a guide. Very good. So there was a two way tie um, between the flip books. And the glass bird. Oh, interesting. So, on Saturday night, everybody, there were 150 people here, and the first thing they collected was the flip books, and the second thing they collected was the glass bird. So you guys are all in the same mind as what, what everyone else is happening. And then we um, did, then we didn't, we were pretty much all out of money. We had enough money to buy two penguins. And then people were like, well, we want more penguins. So then some people at one table said, we'll buy a penguin. And some people at another buy table said, we'll buy a penguin. And somebody else said, I'll buy that painting of the red deer for the museum. And so that happened. And then somebody else said, I will buy those drawings. So the only thing we did not collect for the museum was the jaguar print. So it was a really cool, successful museum. So we do have just a limited amount of money but then some other crazy, generous stuff happens. Any questions that, as you look at this? How much, what's the price of the bird? So, um, it, during the evening we do have all the prices, but they are prices that like, I have negotiated as a museum, as an institution. And normally, once we collect work into the collection, we don't talk about the price. So, the work in this room ranged from $1,800 to 11,000. So there are, you know, different works in here, but those were also prices that I negotiated. So oftentimes a gallery, when I call them and say, I want this, but can you give me a museum price? 
then they'll say, yes, we want to be in the collection in the museum, and they'll give me a different kind of a price. <laughs> so, so, um, so, the, so, yeah, the things range from like 11,000, 12,000 down to, you know, one penguin is like $300. So, you know, that kind of thing. But because we wanted more of them, we did that. So, so can you guys see the red deer? Behind you. In, the, in this painting? I'm, pre I'm just standing here so nobody backs up into this painting. <laughs> so, you guys see it? Yes. So, what Shelley Reed did was she took a little part of a painting and blew it up and made a portrait of that red deer. And land, these are uh, red deer, and this is a very romantic painting, so really dramatic with all kinds of clouds and weather going on, and, um, and uh, of the Scottish Highlands. And we are going to hang her portrait of that red deer right next to it so that the two works can have a conversation between a contemporary work and an older historic piece. The fun thing about Lancier is that that uh, image of that red deer has been used by the Hartford Insurance Company and also is on the label of Glenfiddich Scotch. And so it ha is very iconic. It's been used in popular culture for advertising and things like that. So we are also able then to talk about how animals are used in our culture otherwise that come from a fine art painting. So, how does okay. That, how does that work in terms of like a company that wants to... <laughs> so there are a bunch of different laws on appropriation or about use of images and it keeps changing and I don't know it exactly what it is and a lot of it has to do with like how, how you use it, how much you change it. Like in terms of Lancier, like I I could be getting this totally wrong. Don't quote me video on this. <laughs> um, but there is a copyright thing with images that 75 years after the artist has died, then I don't, I mean, there is, it's yeah. so complicated. And there are a lot of lawsuits that happen. Um, a more recent lawsuit that has happened in our political world is that uh, Shepard Ferry, who's a street artist, used a photograph of Barack Obama to make the poster that said hope on it. So that photographer wanted credit for Shepard Ferry using that image of his. And so they came to an agreement, I think there was a lawsuit, and figured that out. There are a bunch of other artists that use other artists' images, and there's always some kind of thing, like, do you credit them? Or do you, you know, how are you going to do it? Or do you change it enough that you, because that, there is something about that. Um, th it also happens in music. Like, people are always, like, you know, using parts of music in other, you know, newer works. And so, you know, there's, there's that kind of appropriation also. Like, how much of that song are you using from the 70s disco and putting it into your newer work? Like, those people are always working that kind of thing out, too. Yeah. So. Well, thank you, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much.